Uh, as Matt uh, said and in, uh, introductions were given, uh, I'm Renee Anthony. Um, I am also at the University of Iowa and I'm, we're going to leave the world of infectious stuff and talk about pretty much anything else that could be in a livestock uh, building. Um, so um, uh, Matt and I have worked together for quite a while uh, looking at this air quality in swine buildings. Um, so some of the data that we'll be presenting are from the Great Plains study. Um, so in your materials, you've got some uh, hot linked information if anything we talk about today uh, is uh, interesting to you. Um, the reason that we did this work is, um, as uh, people these days have learned, uh, getting your hands on dust masks are now more difficult than they were when we started, uh, but we have had recommendations to protect workers in livestock production buildings, uh, but adoption was uh, fairly low. Um, so we thought we'd look at some engineering controls uh, instead uh, in order to control some of the exposures that we're going to talk about today. So the outline of what I want to share with you uh, first is to have a discussion of what is in the air of these buildings. We're going to take all the bioaerosols out because Matt did a great job talking about that. Uh, and then I just want to briefly touch on some of these health effect studies that are out there and talk about the long history of evidence that the air quality in these types of operations uh, can be of concern to people that spend uh, any amount of time, three hours or more in these buildings. Um, and then I'll get a little more into detail about what these contaminants are, where they come from, and then we'll talk about exposures. We'll talk about should we consider just looking at OSHA's numbers or doing something a little more advanced to look at mixtures because they all have similar health effects. And then we'll talk about some of the study data and some ways that we've looked at how can we reduce some of these exposures in the building, setting up the interventions that Mike will talk about in the next section. So first of all, what is in the air? Um, so we've got dust in the buildings. Um, so most of the time, these uh, dust contain organic compounds. There's a little bit of gravel and, and silica that may come in from outside, but most of the materials are organic compounds. The uh, majority of it is uh, fecal materials from our livestock animals, as well as feed particles, animal dander, molds, pollens, insect parts, which is always fun, um, as well as having uh, some compounds of virus and bacteria. If you look into the literature uh, with any depth, um, you'll see a bunch of measures in historical papers that are focused on this thing called endotoxin. Um, the endotoxin is basically um, a component of a cell wall in bacteria, and there have been a lot of relationships that have been looked at to see the uh, concentration of endotoxin that comes from our dust sample um, is related to uh, pulmonary inflammation and lung disease, um, not just in livestock buildings, but in other settings in agriculture. So people have been sampling endotoxin as a marker of um, indication that there may be um, health effects associated with what's in that dust. Um, but Matt has talked about a whole bunch of more modern methods to measure what actually those bacteria and viruses are. So I think a lot of the literature is going to um, start figuring out if identification of specific uh, viral or bacterial components uh, gets us better information on how hazardous uh, something might be in a building. Um, but in addition to dust, we also have gases. And so I think everybody kind of knows that we've got ammonia in livestock buildings. Um, it is a respiratory irritant. Um, and uh, as one would imagine, it comes from the uh, urine excreted by our livestock. Another compound um, to consider thinking about is carbon dioxide. So it's not the deadly carbon monoxide. Um, most of the concentrations in our uh, livestock buildings, again, I'm from the Midwest, so our buildings are closed up pretty tightly in the wintertime uh, because it's really cold here. Um, so in order to save heat, we tighten up a building and in some cases CO2, our carbon dioxide uh, levels increase over time. Um, so that source is our animals exhaling, so we can't control that, but we also, um, I'll present a little bit of a intervention that we looked at for heaters in these buildings. So um, we found and proposed some solutions to that. Um, as you know, uh, I think you guys have participated in manure gas uh, sessions um, and you know that hydrogen sulfide and methane can be in the building as long as your um, manure management program is um, 
uh, handling the manure as well. This doesn't tend to be an issue until we start agitating or disturbing the manure. Uh, in some cases in the Midwest, we do have some bacterial contamination uh, that's basically trapping high, high concentrations of methane. So in some buildings, when we have this foaming manure, we do have a uh, urgent safety issue of uh, explosive uh, concentrations uh, with methane. So um, for the purposes of this talk, though, I'm not gonna get into that detail. That's a whole talk on its own. So what are the health effects? Um, a lot of the studies that have looked at livestock production workers um, have pretty much looked at health outcomes, um, included a long list here, um, based on uh, type of operation and how long somebody is working in the operation. Not all of them, all of the studies have identified specific contaminants um, that are associated with these. And if you think about it, we have a lot of different types of contaminants that may be inside of a building uh, that becomes a little difficult to tease out. Is it the dust? Is it the endotoxin? Is it the ammonia? What is it that are causing these effects? So um, we see things such as bronchial inflammation, um, decreases in lung function. If anybody's had to blow into a spirometer at the doctor's office to figure out what your lung capacity is, um, there are some declines of people that work in livestock production buildings. Um, so a lot of these respiratory symptoms um, have been looked at. I've only went back to the 1991 studies, uh, but we have data that go back into the early 80s that find similar health effects. What's interesting is because of uh, the mixture of compounds in these buildings trying to tease out um, what is the cause becomes a little bit complicated. Um, so in looking at um, what's in a livestock building, we do recommend looking at the mixture of chemicals. And we're gonna focus on uh, a few of those today. Um, so most of the literature that started um, and went through the 1990s um, will use this measure called total dust. And the cassette over on the right-hand side of your screen is the device that we use to collect those samples. Um, so um, Matt mentioned that dust becomes hazardous as a function of where it deposits in the respiratory system. Um, so in kind of a graphical way of representing that, large particles, if you breathe them in, um, you know as well as I, things are gonna get stuck in your nose or hit the back of your throat, and that's where they deposit. As particles get smaller and smaller, they clear your head airways region pass through your tracheal bronchial region and the really small stuff gets down into this gas exchange region. So when we do monitoring these days, we look at inhalable particles, which include the big particles, and then respirable particles, which exclude all those big particles and really just focus on those small ones. So, um, so there are devices that we'll use in industrial hygiene going out um, to capture those different fractions. So instead of using that total sampler, if we just wanna look at how many small particles they are, which is how many things get deep into your lung, we'll use something like this cyclone to basically pull all those big particles out. But if we're concerned about anything that gets into the respiratory system and deposits head airways all the way down to the um, respirable system, um, we may use a button sampler or uh, an IOM sampler. Um, and so most of the papers have focused on this IOM sampler. This button sampler has a nice um, cover on it to keep uh, flies out, but uh, just beware in poultry, that tends to at times get coated in feathers. So uh, there are some uh, selection uh, information on which type of device do we wanna use for different uh, livestock environments. So in addition to looking at this uh, dust measurement, and all we do is we take a sample and then we measure to see how much weight it is and we come up with a, a mass per volume of air sampled. Um, recommendation that I'm gonna be talking about today is a 2.5 milligram per meter cube concentration. Um, we also have a recommendation for mixtures in barns um, that we have adopted, which is a seven part per million ammonia. And so we typically will sample that not with uh, any of these kinds of devices, but with a direct reading monitor. So this is just an example of one that's available um, specifically for ammonia. Um, so uh, the industry specific recommended exposure limits that I have above um, are indeed lower than OSHA's um, particulates not otherwise regulated. So if you're looking at OSHA, that's the term that you would find in the um, 
OSHA standards. Um, and it's also uh, a little bit lower than the ammonia permissible exposure limits. Remember that all of OSHA's exposure limits are based on hazardous information that we knew back in, I'm not kidding, 1969. So we know a little bit more about hazards these days. Um, so um, I'm going to be showing you some of these um, more consensus standards um, that are called threshold limit values or TLDs. Um, so if we kind of look at some recommendations for livestock exposure limits, based on if you're exposed below these, we don't see health effects uh, data in the literature versus if people are exposed to a combination that's higher than these, we do see health effects. And so um, for swine industry, these are the recommendations on the bottom line here. So we would measure this inhalable with this IOM, we'd measure this respirable with the cyclone, and then we'd use direct reading monitor to measure these other compounds. One monitor for ammonia, one for CO, which is if your heater's not working well, that's when you'd find that, um, or carbon dioxide CO2. So in the study that we have looked at, um, we wanted to see what are the background concentrations and we, can we treat the air in a uh, swine barn, so it's a swine farrowing room, um, can we treat it? And in doing that, we got some information on um, concentrations in the building. So in our barn that we uh, did our study, um, our inhalable dust, uh, so that's uh, all came out below this 2.8 concentration limit. Um, so that was good. Uh, we did get substantial loading, but um, uh, was not as concerning as our respirable dust. So if we look at the um, industry recommendation for respirable dust, um, the red dots are when we don't have our air cleaning device on. And so we were kind of approaching uh, levels of concern for respirable dust uh, on those days. Um, as I mentioned, the hydrogen sulfide uh, was not a problem, nor was carbon monoxide. But we did identify that carbon dioxide um, on uh, every day exceeded um, what we call this, this safety limit of 1540 parts per million. Um, and that was a little shocking to us. Um, so we actually um, got to look at the relationship between our measured carbon dioxide um, and um, related it to uh, how many sows we had in the barn, because remember it's generated by exhaled air. Uh, of our livestock um, in the dead of winter with the windows closed um, and minimal outdoor air. Um, so we could estimate, given the outside temperature um, and number of sows, what the carbon dioxide concentrations were going to be. Um, so uh, ammonia, um, one of the things to, to think about in at least our region of the world is we start out pretty good, low concentrations. Um, and then over um, a few months or a month into our cold weather, um, we start exceeding these industry limits. Um, so we're okay with OSHA's exposure limit um, and then our consensus standard. But again, if we want to consider dust and ammonia and the combined mixed effects, um, we actually have concerns about ammonia um, in these buildings. So if we can control the dust, then we can live with a little bit higher ammonia concentration. Um, so our system is looking at reducing dust um, and then seeing, um, letting kind of ammonia uh, be where it needs to be. Um, we actually found uh, that the heaters were associated with about 800 parts per million background concentration in the room. I think most of you are probably familiar with this uh, EV White Guardian uh, heater, um, which doesn't vent any of the combustion gases. So we located uh, more of a greenhouse heater. Uh, it's all stainless steel design um, and with a minimal difference in cost. It's $500 more to buy the Efinity than it is the EB White, LB White. Um, we do want to point out that there's some electrical hazards on the back that you do need to cover up that the manufacturer didn't. Um, but we got a, a fairly substantial 800 parts per million reduction um, just by having the combustion gases inside of that heat exchanger vent outside of the building. Um, so the replacement cost was really a $500 difference um, and it has been running in that building for I think four years now and hasn't had a problem. Um, so the heater is performing really well because it's only heating with really clean air, um, which has been uh, I think a benefit. 
Um, poultry data, if we look at these mi mixture types of recommendations, um, this is actually from Matt's study a couple years ago. Um, and the um, inhalable dust concentrations were uh, substantially higher than the recommended limit. Uh, and then the ammonia concentrations were above the, the mixture limit as well. So they were reasonably okay if you don't look at the effects of the mixture, but when you start parsing out the combined effect of these, um, there's some indication to improve the air quality in, um, in, that in uh, poultry barns. Um, that was the purpose of that study, to look to see if there were some ways they could uh, do things differently to reduce concentrations. Um, and then cattle also, um, there's a recent 2014 study looking at concentrations. Um, the total dust, uh, the inhalable dust um, averaged over our 124 task samples um, to be about one milligram per meter cubed, which is good. Um, but they um, uh, broke down the recommendations um, for tasks uh, when concentrations went higher. Um, so repenning of animals, handling of silos were high. Uh, they actually recommended um, that when handling of feed and seeds and distributing bedding, um, based on these concentrations, they did recommend um, wearing respiratory protection. And apparently typo on the next one. Um, so those were with fully automatic robotic milking. Um, those are the tasks when exposures were high. Without automatic milking, um, they uh, recommend if you're using the rail feed dispensers that that's an opportunity to put, uh, to reduce exposures to workers in that industry. So that being said, uh, I think I've covered up all of the topics that I set out to do. Um, I will leave you with a link um, if you want a quick but recent summary of literature across all of the different uh, livestock and poultry uh, exposure literature. Um, I've got a pretty good link here.